I am honored to be with Peter Frau, co-owner and CEO of FAS Machine Tools in Durban, South Africa. Welcome to the podcast. Um, <laughs> welcome to the podcast, Peter. It's, it's yeah, good to have you. Uh, the, the honor is mine. Uh, uh, no, I was, I was uh, delighted to be able to participate in this podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're also here with Lloyd, my dad, always awesome. This is really cool that we get to talk uh, about South Africa and machining. Um, I think on most people's minds in the United States, they're not even thinking about South, Af South Africa and they're not even really, and they're definitely not thinking about South Africa and machining. So uh, Peter has been around this business for a long time. Um, so first, Peter, I, I want you to give a little bit of background about um, your companies. Um, and uh, you've got a, a startup and uh, another company that's tooling up machines. So let's get a little bit about that. And then I want to know um, how you got into machining. Then we're going to just learn about South Africa and the, the industrial machining world over there. So give me the scoop on, um, so your, your other company is Rainfeld? Ren Renfield, yeah, R-E-N-F-I-E-L-D, -E Renfield Machine Tools. Okay, so uh, Renfield Machine Tools, when did you start that? I started that in 1991, okay. and uh, it's um, it's actually uh, an operation a, a little bit like uh, Graf Pinkett, in that uh, we 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 set up to to re recondition and tool up um, wh what you would call screw machines. Uh, we 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 tend to call them cam automatics here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, both single spindles and multi spindles, and um, and so that's what we did. We 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 buy uh, we buy machines in uh, where we could find them at dark corners and rebuild <laughs> them and uh, treasure and hunters. Up. And and uh, so all our contracts were turnkey uh, projects where uh, where the, uh, the customer received a machine which is producing his components I see. Um, so i so not unlike graph pinkett actually right uh, right that's that's Renfield machine tools which still which still exists and we still do some of that work although we broadened out and do a lot of other uh, bespoke machines of different kinds good so, well so these then, days you have to diversify because yeah a lot of those customers that have been running the multi spindles are now they're diversifying. So we, yeah. you know, have to get more versatile and okay. So meanwhile, you're doing that and now you have a new company, a startup, yeah, different technology. Give us the scoop on that. Yeah. Well, when, just in the course of, of uh, doing that work and also, Prior to that, I'd run a, a production company uh, for nine years, just um, running running cam machines, uh -huh. uh, both singles and multis. Uh, so for nine years, just making widgets by the hundreds of thousands for the motor industry and, and all sorts of industries. So, so I had a pretty good grounding in the repetition turning uh, business. And then, of course, to rebuilding various types of machines, you get to familiar with with the strengths and weaknesses of each. And what struck me was that uh, cam machines tended to have fast cycle times, but were not user friendly. And uh, CNC lathes, which had started to come on onto the scene in about '65, I suppose, uh, were very user friendly, but generally were didn't have quick cycle times because they only had one tool working on the workpiece at a time. Um, so that put me on a search for a holy grail of a, of a machine which had the fast cycle times of a cam machine, 
the user friendliness of a CNC uh, at a price that, that you could afford. And so that that was what gave rise to to the startup, which is Fast Machine Tools. And is there anything like this machine? I know you have to tell us exactly the, the specs of it, but is there anything like this somewhere uh, else in the world? Yeah, no, you can you can buy uh, other machines with a similar spec. Mm -hmm. uh, they generally, there's they, quite a lot of manufacturers um, make them. Um, and, and uh, but the the difference is we've managed to 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 contain the price. We managed to get the price way down, so it's typically about half the price mm -hmm. so uh, it's, of what what you'd pay for a for another machine. So it's it's kind of like a partial Swiss machine. Yeah, it's like a it's like a Swiss machine, but it has a fixed headstock. Okay. And uh, so it's it's got uh, it's it's got a, a an eight station turret which moves in two axes. It's got a dedicated turning slide which moves in two axes. It's got a dedicated forming slide and a dedicated uh, parting slide. So so you can have four tools working simultaneously uh, uh, on the workpiece. And and so it's it's kind of like a, a, a screw machine in that regard. So that's how mm -hmm. you get your cycle times down. You have uh, lots of things happening simultaneously. And, Peter, is uh, this the time? The, yeah. So, and it, in a way, it's it's quicker than a than a Swiss machine because the, the the disadvantage of a Swiss machine is when the when the headstock is sliding, you can't be uh, doing forming work. Um, so, whereas that's half the half the uh, advantage of having a multi slide machine is that you can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, make make things happen simultaneously. I see. What were you What were you going to say, Dad? Is this the kind of machine that uh, they're running in India and in China? We hear they're running a lot of uh, inexpensive, um, limited uh, CNC machines. Well, I, I, uh, I'm not sure, Lloyd what you'd be referring to, um, but certainly, um, you know, the different manufacturers, uh, Gildermeister, Mupem, um, uh, uh, Traub, they, they all make variants of, of what we are building. Uh, Is it so like a Ganesh? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that. It's um, probably got a different name over yeah. in South Look, Africa. It's, it's, if you can imagine a just the configuration of a normal brown and sharp, except that it's a CNC mm. and uh, the turret moves in, in two axes. So you can do all kinds of internal profiling. Um, and, it, and it's got a, a turning slide, which will do external profiling. So it's kind of like that. So it's a, it's a, it's a very versatile CNC version of a brown and sharp, if you like, uh, in terms of its its architecture. So what is unique about our machine is that um, the, the chucking uh, all, all the uh, non-productive actions are electromechanical. There's nothing hydraulic on the machine. So it's very, very fast. So it'll feed up the material in less than a second. Uh, whereas generally CNC blades are more like five seconds going to get a hydraulic story there and uh, so you know i've got a because i've got a cam machine background um i said yeah, you know let's let's use uh what we can of that technology to get the cycle times down so so really we've got a machine which you know i can honestly say it's a it's the fastest gun in town and you can afford to buy it interesting um and you are 75 years old. That's correct. 75 years young. 75 years young. I'm about the same age as, as, as Lloyd, is that right? I'm here. Yeah, I, I say, are, are we the same <laughs> age, Lloyd? We are yeah, the we, same age. Uh, Absolutely. Was this 19, 1944? Was, was a vintage year? <laughs> you could say that. The yeah. end of World War II, or getting close to it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. How, how, 
how does it feel to have a startup at the age of 75? I, it makes me think kind of of, uh, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Colonel Sanders. He, he, started, he started that company when he was in like his 70s or something, maybe late 60s. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's exactly the same. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I think, you know, as I was saying, I mean, both both, uh, yourself, Lloyd, and and, and myself, we've been blessed with good brains. They're still still functioning well. We've got a responsibility to to use them. So I don't really... um, you know, think too much about my age. There's just too much interesting stuff to do still. So I just keep doing it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, Depends on how I'm feeling in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, um, let's get a little bit of a quick background um, further, a little back on you, Peter. And I think that'll, that'll give a little bit more of a, of a look into South Africa and business there, et cetera. Um, so you come from your uh, a background, a family background in machining, yes? Well, I come from a, an engineering background. So, so my uh, my father was uh, an engineer in a in a, a power utility uh, in South Africa, and um, and then I also did a mechanical engineering degree uh, at the, the university in Durban and also joined the same power utility. It's called Eskom. Uh, it's, it's, it's a major power supplier, uh, electricity supply in South Africa. It's a parastatal. And uh, yeah, I worked there for uh, some seven years working on power plants hmm. and uh, ended up um, involved um, mostly in instrumentation and then on, on com- uh, online computers. I actually trained in the States around San Diego for eight months writing software for the first computers that were going into power plants to monitor the plant. Interesting. And uh, then uh, I ended up uh, being promoted as a senior engineer in, in Eskim up to the head office, which is in Johannesburg. And uh, both my wife and I decided we didn't we didn't want to spend the rest of our days in Johannesburg. <laughs> it's a great big sprawling metropolis, and we had lived there for a couple of years on and off. So mm. we wanted very much to get back to the coast, uh, which is where I'd grown up. And so uh, that ended up bringing about a career change because I I got into kind of a specialised software online real-time field and I couldn't get a job uh, down here in Durban. So uh, my dad had this little business running some cam machines, making valve guards actually, automotive valve guards and other things. And I I joined him kind of with a temporary, he gave me like a three or four months project to work on just so I could get down here and look for a job. In Durban. In Durban, yeah, and then I, I just kind of got got interested in in manufacturing. So it was like a, a career change which I hadn't planned. Mm. And uh, then gradually, my, my dad and I grew grew that business to to a fair size. We had at the I think we had about twenty four single spindles, a couple of multis, and a whole lot of a whole lot of uh, second operation machines, scentless grinders, and so on. What period of time was this? That was that was uh, uh, seventy three, so seventy three to about eighty two, nine, okay. nine years. I was in that game, and so so that's where I really got my background in in uh, in in you know mass production of turn parts. And you know you're always uh, you're in that jobbing environment. You're always trying to pit your wits against against the competition to, you know, get a clever cycle time and a cuter way of doing something. So, but then um, I, I was out of the business altogether for about seven years. Um, 
doing a, a lot of um, reconciliation work, both uh, within the church context, also in a political context. Okay, so so let's stop here. So this is um, nineteen around nineteen ninety. Yes. That yeah no that would be in about nineteen eighty two. Uh, 1983 to uh, about 1990, there, thereabouts, was about seven years. Seven okay. Years. All right. So now we need to rewind things. Um, I need to know, we need to know the, the Cliff Notes version. I don't know if you know Cliff Notes, but we need to know the, the quick version of apartheid in South Africa, because this is, this is, related to what you were doing, the reconciliation, and, and it's totally related to other questions I have about machining there. So give us the scoop on the history of the country in like maybe three to five minutes. Okay, as, far uh, as, as far as apartheid, did I say that right, apartheid? Yeah, it's a, the correct pronunciation is actually apartheid. 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 apartheid will do fine. Um, yeah, in, in 1948, um, the, the, the Nationalist Party came into power. And no one needs to know that, that um, the South African population is comprised of, of four broad um, population groups, I suppose you'd say, uh, blacks, whites, Indians, and, and people of mixed race who are termed colored, although that doesn't have a uh, any sort of pejorative overtones that term. Mm -hmm. And amongst the whites, they divide into English speaking whites and Afrikaans speaking whites. Okay. So the, the English speaking whites, and of which I'm one, have generally um, uh, their, their ancestors hail from England. Whereas the, the Afrikaans, uh, and Afrikaans is a Dutch derivative they hail from uh, both Holland and France. Okay. The, do they do they all speak English now, though? At least the yeah, Afrikaans. Much, yeah, it would be unusual for someone not to speak uh, English. Uh, reasonably, English is is a lingua franca uh, in in South Africa for for everyone actually. That would make so, sense. Uh, and and uh, Afrikaans speaking people tend to be very bilingual. English speaking people not not so much so so I, I speak English and Afrikaans reasonably well not not super fluent but reasonably well okay so you have the there's four groups of people 1948 the the Afrikaans the, come to power the Afrikaans come to power and they proceeded to to uh, implement this policy of apartheid which is basically apartheid quite literally means uh, apartness or separation. So it was a policy in which uh, the, the different race groups were, were grouped into separate geographical areas. And so, um, and, and the, uh, the, the whites controlled the economy, they, they controlled the, the, the majority of the land areas, uh, the, the cities, and, and the, uh, it was only the whites who had the franchise, mm -hmm. and what's uh, comprised only around about twenty percent of the population at that stage. So it was a it was a very uh, uh, unjust situation which couldn't last. But they were able to make it last for a while. They made it last for about uh, forty years, but it, it got uh, tougher and tougher. Uh, there was uh, there was economic sanctions on the on the country and. Um, the you know the, the the blacks particularly who were totally disenfranchised uh, they you know just mounted a, uh, what was known as the struggle uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of resistance groups many of them based outside of South Africa and uh, so the, the nationalist government just just banned all opposition parties apart from white parties and so it, it was really a, it was a powder keg waiting to explode. And then um, in, in the late 80s, in, in the late, uh, 80s 
um, a, a new prime minister came into power, a man called uh, F.W. de Klerk. And he was, he realized that this was just an uh, absolute uh, disaster waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. So he proceeded to uh, release Mr. Nelson, Nelson Mandela, and uh, who had been incarcerated for some 26 years. Uh, plus a number of other um, uh, political prisoners, and he unbanned all the political parties, and uh, then um, embarked on a process of, of negotiating a new constitution, uh, which uh, which came into force with the first election in 1994. So it was a, an absolute milestone, and the transition was. Uh, it was not without violence, but it was relatively peaceful. And the actual uh, voting in 1994 was totally peaceful. So it was, it was quite miraculous, actually. Um, and uh, so Mr. Mandela was the first um, uh, prime minister in, in, uh, um, in, in, in the non-racial democratically re elected government. I, I've always wondered, so they held Mandela prisoner for how, how long? 26 years. So why would they, I mean, why would they allow him to have a voice and send out, did he write books when he was in prison? No, 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 he was, he was totally locked down, but he, he had his, he had his communication channels, uh, obviously they were illegal ones. Um, so he was able to communicate with the, the other people waging the struggle. Um, I say uh, the ANC, which was his party, African National Congress was, was one of the banned parties, but it, uh, it had its bases outside the country uh, in, in uh, in Mozambique and, and uh, Zimbabwe and so on. And uh, so he, he actually, he was the leader of the struggle even though he was incarcerated, but he, he, he was not allowed any formal communication and, and he's, you know, anything he said was banned and so on. So okay. there was a, it, was a, it was a total draconian pre-censorship uh, situation. Okay, so Meanwhile, um, so in the late 80s, um, things are changing. Yeah. You were, you had this machining business and then um, you, you're also a, a minister? No, I'm not a minister, I, I, but I'm, I'm an active, uh, I'll term it a very active layman in my church, which is, um, it's the Methodist church, which is, uh, I guess, somewhat akin to the um, United Methodist Church in, in America, but, but a little different, it's kind of an African version, if you like. Okay. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm an, uh, a preacher, I've been involved in various leadership positions. I, I, at the moment, I sit on a, a, a doctrine and ethics Com commission for the whole of Southern Africa. Oh, wow. So I'm quite involved. Uh, in so, okay, so, um, so there's, De Klerk comes in, starts making changes, and then you had this machining company, um, and you kind of took, took some time off to be part of this movement, correct? Uh, no, the chronology is not quite like that. I, okay. I, I left uh, what was the, uh, you know, my, what was the family, it was a family business, it was my dad's business really. I left there in about um, 83, uh, whereas Mandela was only released in 89. Um, and so, uh, but I was involved in various community upliftment projects, and I say doing recon reconciliation work, and, and sort of under the under the radar reconciliation work involving political figures as well. We just we just kind of get guys who who, who claim to be Christians, uh, but were high profile figures, 
and just just got him around a, a you know a, a table with a cup of coffee and a plate of sandwiches and get him getting him to talk. So I was very much under the radar stuff, and in a way, it was a microcosm of what happened between de Klerk and and Mandela, because what happened was that they formed a close relationship bond. While he was in prison, or sorry, while he was in prison. Well, it started while he was in prison, uh, but then it continued once he'd been released. Uh, because mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite a gap between his release. It was about five years, of course, between his release and that that first democratic election. Okay. So, um, so, so de Klerk was just the president for a long time? Or yeah, prime minister? He, yeah, he was the president. Um, uh, he was probably president for about... 10 years, I think. I'd be, so there's and, no term limits? Uh, yeah, no, there is, there, there, there are limits, but both, both de Klerk and Mandela won the Nobel Peace Prize. They both won the, the Peace Prize because in a way, uh, you know, they, they both contributed to the transition because Mandela, of course, uh, you know, de Klerk had to lay down his power um, and uh, you know, in, in which he did in a nonviolent way, it was quite remarkable. And, so, uh, so yeah, yeah. It was an amazing time. May I may I ask Peter if you ever gave serious thought to leaving South Africa? Yeah, uh, it's a good question, Lloyd. Because of course, um, many. Many whites uh, did did emigrate, uh, you know, during the 80s for for fear of what was what might happen. In fact, what would probably happen um, for fear of what the country would look like once uh, an, an ANC government came to power. So there was a it was quite a massive um, exodus, uh, particularly of 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 qualified people. Um, you know, doctors and so on, uh, to many to New Zealand, Australia, England, Canada, and some to the States. But as as for myself um, and my wife, we, we never seriously considered that. Um, I, I, I just have a conviction this is where I'm meant to be. Uh, actually, I actually... <laughs> How, how can I say it? South Africa is a is a a very complex yeah. country with its different people groups, and of course, you can't just talk about black South Africans because there's several tribes. Uh, there are eleven official languages, and so wow. Uh, so it's complex, but it's also colourful, uh, and I enjoy. <laughs> I enjoy the pe the different peoples uh, in in our in our country. So I mean, in a way, it's it has a kinship to America because America is very multicultural. Sure. Um, so so yeah, it's a bit of a long answer to your question, Lloyd. But but no, I, I'm very very happy to uh, to to be a citizen of of South Africa. Um, of course, we've got a son who stays in America, and we, we're happy about that. He's a he's actually holds dual citizenship. Uh, he's a U.S. citizen, but he retains his South African citizenship, and he's very proud of that. And so uh, we've yeah we've never had a, an urge to to, to immigrate. Um, do many do many South Africans wish they could uh, emigrate? Yeah, I, I think they do, uh, and and many have, uh, and it's it's uh, it's kind of varied, you know. I think um, S South Africa's fortunes and economy have been up and down a bit like a, a roller coaster. At a season when the economy really boomed, uh, in that was probably just around the turn of the century, uh, the economy was really doing very well. Uh, uh, then, unfortunately, we had a very bad president for nine years, uh, Mr. Jacob Zuma, who did a huge damage to the country, to the economy. He was a very corrupt man. Um, and we've got a good president now, but he's he's uh, he's struggling to 
dig the dig the economy out of a hole. Right, and I'm sure it's in a big hole now with the pandemic. Yeah, the the pandemic doesn't help at all there. So um, so again, sorry, Lloyd, a bit of a long answer, but yes, a lot of a lot of um, I'm speaking of whites now, who. Uh, who contemplate immigration. Some would like to and and can't easily. Some give it a try and then come back. Um, but um, yeah. So, what about uh, black people? Do many black people want to emigrate or do emigrate? Not not so much. Not so much. You know. Is it because uh, they don't have the resources, or because they don't really want to? Well, Both. I think there's I think there's good opportunities for for blacks. Although the unemployment level is high, um, there there are quite um, strong uh, black empowerment protocols in place, and and so the you know there are like affirmative the, action. Yeah, that's right, and and so um, you know the playing field has is. Uh, which used to slope steeply in favor of whites now now slopes the other way um, and so um i think it's it's more the more the old whiteies who who kind of think hey, maybe we, we the grass is greener somewhere else <laughs> um, certainly the percentage of whites has 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 steadily dropped over the years it used to be about uh, over twenty percent, mm -hmm. it's now down around nine percent. Nine percent is white white people, both yep. British and Afrikaans. That's right, Afrikaners. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious where, yeah. whether the um, uh, dramatic rise in the price of precious metals has improved the economy significantly in South Africa recently? Well, yes, it has to be a good thing because uh, a, a lot of, um, so, you know, a, a good sector of South Africa's economy is on mining. Uh, so it's the country's blessed with, with, with minerals. Um, it's got you know, plenty of gold, platinum, <coughs> aluminum, iron. And, Diamonds. And, uh, and, a, and a whole bunch more. And yeah, diamonds, of course. Um, so, so yeah, commodity price, an increase in commodity prices has to be good. Um, it's it's good for the good for the gold price. It's good for the gold mining industry, of course. You know, so. so, uh, so does yeah, that it, filter? Does that filter down to your business at all? Um, Lloyd, it's, it's, it's difficult to say, you know, the trouble is my business is like yours. When you sell capital goods, if, if you, if you make a good sale, you think the economy is booming. Exactly. If you don't, you think it's in a recession. Um, but um, so a better barometer really, it would be like how the steel merchants and the heat treatment guys doing, you know, those, those guys are are a better barometer of the economy. Um, so, so I look. I mean, if the economy does well, all businesses do better, right? Uh, you know, and so it it it, it does affect my business. But uh, at the moment, I mean, we we we're just completing what for us is quite a big contract, which has carried us right through. Oh, this, that's good. This COVID period, uh, which is great, and I'm hoping as a result of this podcast, podcast that's going to help business to boom. So, what well, you know, it sh well, it should. I mean, we've already um, talked to people who have gotten inquiries from their podcasts. Yeah. Um, but, anyways, um, pay no mind of some people coming in the room. There, we've got a building inspector. <laughs> You're not going to be in here very long, yeah, right? One more picture this way. Oh. Okay. Just time out one second. No problem. Okay. So, um, 
Are there many uh, black people or colored people involved in machining, as far as you know? Uh, yeah, plenty. Uh, plenty, I would say. It's, it's, it's really pretty much in line with the demography of the whole country. Uh, I think if you asked uh, how many black people are the owner of machining businesses, mm -hmm. that, that would be definitely skewed. Uh, I mean, they, they do exist, but they those would tend to be more, uh, the ownership would tend to be perhaps more in whites, Indians, coloreds. But I mean, things are changing. There's, there's a shift. Um, what? Yeah. What's the income disparity in the country? Is there a I mean, are there like just crazy dirt poor people and super rich people? Um, yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Uh, it's it's uh, the, you you get the you get the very wealthy and you get you get the very poor, uh, and and so and, and and also culturally, there's a, there's this um, first world and and third world. So I mean. This, South African cities look pretty much like American cities, actually. They're big motorways, and and uh, it's, it's, it's a city, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, you, you go not very far, and you'll get into a rural area where, where there are mud huts, and, and uh, Interesting. sometimes people are having to carry carrying water and, and buckets in their heads, you know. Um, you know, ha having said that, it's it's very different to a country like India, where I mean that is that's just abject poverty you see all around you. Whereas whereas here, um, you know, South Africa is reckoned a sort of a mecca uh, for for people in Africa. A lot of people come down from Africa, from Zimbabwe and and uh, Malawi and so on, mm -hmm. uh, the Congo and find work in South Africa. So there's, there's a huge population of, of uh, you know, so-called aliens. Um, I, I've, I have a, a very good Malawian chap work in my workforce. Interesting. Um, yeah. um, what um, are, are, is engineering a popular, uh, popular subject? Uh, I think I think popular would be overstating it, but it's it's certainly it's a it's a career choice that, that many would opt for. So, so all the South African universities, or most of them, would have an engineering faculty uh, with all the all the different branches. So we right civil, mechanical, electrical, electronic. Uh, so so yeah. What about like here, everybody complains about, they can't find good people. They can't find people to work in the shops. Um, it's, yeah, I, I what think about there? That, yeah, look, I, I think that is true uh, um, to find skilled people. I mean, that's, that's really one of the reasons uh, for, the, for the move from cam machines Mm -hmm. to to C machines because um, the cam machines require a tool setter and he's uh, he's making lots of little adjustments and everything has to be right before you get good parts uh, and those guys are in increasingly hard to find and uh, so whereas a, you know a digital machine is 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 more user friendly and less demanding. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, to, it, it, I'd, I'd say that's similar um, here, difficulty in Tell, uh, Peter, I'd like to know about Durban. If I wanted to visit Durban, what would be the first few things that you would show me? Yeah, I mean, who's heard of Durban? I've never heard of Durban. Oh, this is well, terrible. I have. And, yeah, well, you're, you're, you're more culturally literate than your average bear, um, in yeah. in my opinion. <laughs> uh, Durban is, uh, is I think arguably the biggest uh, biggest port in Africa. Certainly hmm. dealing with with mixed cargo. Uh, it's a it's a it's it's a 
It's the third largest city in South Africa. It's, it first comes Johannesburg, and then Cape Town and Durban are very similar size. Everyone's heard of Cape Town. Um, and, and so it's, it is uh, South Africa's major port in terms of hand, handling uh, mixed cargo. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's only about 400 miles from Durban to Johannesburg. So there's a huge amount of, of traffic between Durban and Johannesburg, both import and export. Um, and it's a, it's a very attractive city because uh, it's, it's in the, a province called KwaZulu-Natal, which uh, is uh, encircled with a mountain range called the Drakensberg. And it's, it's got, uh, Durban's got great surfing beaches. They have uh, major surfing competitions. Interesting. In Durban. Uh, wonderful swimming beaches, which and you can swim pretty much all year round because there's a warm current called the Mozambique Current, which uh, which uh, streams along the coast, and um, it's got a it's got a big harbour, big natural harbour, um, like almost like an indoor lake, which is entered through a narrow canal. And uh, that is screened from the wind by a, a, a bluff, uh, and and so it's a it's a wonderful harbour, and it's a very attractive city. It's it's surrounded by hills, and and I think it's a wonderful place. How come you've never heard of it? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe I have. I don't know. But uh, I was I was just uh, just it's, me out is there. Johannesburg like is it like New York? Is it huge? How big is it? It's uh, it's just, it's it's somewhat akin to uh, uh, it's 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 far more like Los Angeles than than more New spread York. out. It's spread out. It's a sprawling uh, setup, and and Greater Johannesburg lies east and west, uh, following the Gold Reef, actually, and uh, it has a it has a very large population. Um, I, can't tell you offhand what it would be. Um, maybe, I don't know, 8 million, something like that. Uh, I'm guessing a bit. Um, and it, it has it has a downtown with, with skyscrapers. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it has more high-rise buildings than LA, but a, of course a whole lot less than New York. This, this question is going to sound kind of stupid, um, but like... Do you live near many animals, wildlife, jungle, lions, tigers? No, tigers are Asia, right? Um, uh, yeah, I know that's not a stupid question at all, uh, Noah. Uh, we we actually live look, we don't we live about um, twenty five miles inland from Durban, in a suburban area. But we're very fortunate that we on the edge of a reserve. So we get, we do get wild animals. We get, but, but like antelope, buck, we get bush buck and, and wild pig and so on. Uh, the, the buck actually in our garden, uh, but that's a little bit unusual. Uh, we certainly don't have lines, you know, roaming down the streets of the city, but, um, I wouldn't have to drive very far to get to a, a game a game uh, park. Um, there's there's a, a smallish one, probably it's about 30 miles from where where I live, and then there's some sizable ones which are up the coast, uh, probably about uh, maybe 200 miles up the coast, and uh, those would those would be real real bush felt with uh, with a big five and and uh yeah so so uh, well you'll have to come and check it out both of you we'd be very very privileged to host you if you can well my wife she she was in um kenya i think on kenya. safari and now like on her list is to go to south africa okay, good. um yeah well hold hold on to that thought yeah, for sure. Uh, do you have anything to add, Dad? I'm curious why your son left. 
Oh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, look, he's he's in the ministry, um, and it's it's curious actually. He he when he finished high school, he did a gap year with a with a Christian organization called Youth for Christ, which I think is international. And um, he during that year he went he went to to California, uh, up to San Francisco actually. And he, at that time, felt uh, uh, a very strong conviction that he was going to be back in California at some time. Uh, at that stage, he wasn't married, but even before he got married, he said to his wife, look, just know this, if, if you're going to marry me, we are going to end up in, in California. Interesting. Uh, now, it took 17 years before that actually happened, but he, he went... <laughs> Not uh, for the the common reason of you know trying to get away from South Africa and its problems. Uh, it's really what's one might call uh, you know name a, a call or a conviction that that's what he was supposed to be doing. And what does he do? He's a, he's in the ministry. Uh, yeah, he's a, he pastors a church, a fair sized church. Uh, in fact, a group of churches uh, down in Orange County. Um, and so, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's um, so that's what he does. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, he, uh, um, he, he's there really as a conviction that that's where he's meant to be and not, not because of trying to run away from South Africa's um, troubles, you know. In fact, at one stage, he, uh, <laughs> he was, uh, he, the, the transition in America was very, very tough for the first two, three years. They, they really would have would have liked to come back to South Africa. Why um, was the transition tough? Well, uh, it's a bit of a long story. He, he went from a healthy church situation here to a church which was in uh. crisis. That was one reason. Also, it's quite a big cultural adjustment. Uh, you know, you think that because we, you, you know, we look similar and speak but speak English, that <laughs> it's good. But but actually, there's quite a big cultural adjustment. Uh, <clears throat> it was difficult financially, um, mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, and, and it was related some some relationship difficulty. So there were a number of things which made it a pretty grueling uh, transition time. Uh, but from a from about three years onwards, they began to really, uh, you know, feel feel this is home. And so it's, now it's very much home, but uh, they come back to South Africa quite often, and so we see a fair, fair amount of them. We're hoping to get across there in December, uh, COVID nineteen permitting. A couple couple more questions. What what is the typical uh, salary for somebody who works? in a in a shop somebody like from the bottom to the top i i think it's it's difficult to just give a figure based on the the, the rand dollar exchange rate what's um what's easier really is to say what's the standard of living mm -hmm. which someone might enjoy <laughs> Uh, and I think it would be, f it's fairly similar because the, the cost of living here is much lower than, than in America, but the salaries are, con you know, are, are, are uh, accordingly lower. But I think, you know, people will have a, a, a three bedroom house and a motor car and perhaps two motor cars and, a, you know, uh, and so I'd say it's it's somewhat somewhat similar um, for for yeah so, so that that would be it. I mean we um, the suburb that I stay in um, you know there's, there's just quite a lot of luxury motor cars floating around and people stay in big houses. And of course we we have the advantage of 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 being able to have servants because the wages for a, a maid or a gardener is quite low. I mean, lower than you'd pay a, 
of Mexican right. and California, for instance. So, but so you're contributing to the economy. You're helping somebody by having a servant. That's right. So, uh, so we have uh, uh, we have a quite a large stand, um, and but we're able to to afford a, a garden, you know, a couple of days a week, and, and so on. So. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, sorry, it's not a very clear answer to your question, Lloyd. But I, I'm just trying to give you. No, a that's a pretty answer. it's a pretty good answer. Um, yeah. Your wife is from uh, Zimbabwe, right? Yeah, that's right. That's correct. So um, you know, give me the give me the spin on that. How did you meet her, and what's it like over there compared to South Africa? Um, well. At, at the time when we met, um, it, Zimbabwe was called Rhodesia, and, and it was still um, was not was not quite as harsh as as um, South Africa's apartheid system, but but not all that different. So very much a mm-hmm. something of a white uh, hegemony there. And uh, she came down to study at the same university. That I, where I was studying engineering, she came down to study. So that was pretty studying. typical that they would come over back and yeah, forth. Yeah, like they had a, there was a, it was a university in uh, what was then called Salisbury, it's now Harare, and uh, but it didn't happen to have that subject. Uh, uh, I don't think it had a good social science faculty. So uh, that was pretty typical for people to come to a South African university, and so that's where we met. Mm, interesting. Uh, I was doing engineering. She was doing social science, and uh, yeah, we kind of, we kind of, uh, it was, you know, some chemistry started there, and we got married uh, about uh, fifteen months after we graduated. We graduated at the same time. And, nice. Uh, yeah. What's What's the most interesting thing that you've learned uh, in the last week? <laughs> Or uh, an an interesting thing. <laughs> well, um, this uh, this peace accord between Israel and the UAE is very interesting. Say uh, that again. Well, the peace accord between who? Between Israel and who? Israel and the United Arab Emirates. It's hot off the press. Uh, I don't but, read the news, so. Yeah, that that is a first peace accord in 25 years. So that's interesting. So there you go. Um, Very interesting. Okay. And, and I think, um, I know you asked me that question before, you know, I read, I read very widely, uh, a whole eclectic range of, of books. I'm just busy reading uh, Tom Jones by Henry Fielding, one of the first British novels, English novels. But I was reading a, um, a, a book called The Chosen by Chaim Potok, who's a... Hmm. Uh, yes, I've heard of that. Jewish, I don't think Jewish I've read writer. it. And so that was very interesting, just to find it, discover that the Hasidic Jews were opposed to the formation of the state of, of hmm. Israel. I thought that was very interesting. Still are. Some of yeah. them. Yeah. Well, there, there are plenty of them in, is, in Israel. But, uh, I know yeah. it's a very strange thing. Yeah. Well, I, I really i I appreciate you uh, letting us interview you, and it's really fascinating. And it's just, I don't know, it's just an exotic place. I want to visit, and you don't normally think of machining and South Africa. I mean, I knew over time. I remember once or twice hearing about buying a machine in South Africa um, with Graf Pinkert, but um, still, it's it's just so interesting. So I really appreciate you having us interview you. Me too. I've uh, been very flattered that you've occasionally commented and uh, on the blog and still seem to among your eclectic pieces of literature still seem to find a spot for uh, today's machining world. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually a big fan. Uh, 
Lloyd, and I, I, I must commend you uh, for the for the style of your journalism. I, I love the transparency and the warmth and the range of subjects which you which you cover. So now it's essential reading for me. Uh, I don't always listen to podcasts, but uh, the blogs. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I love reading them. So, so as long as you read the summaries, because the summaries uh, take me forever. Yeah, I, I, I always <laughs> read the summaries. Be assured. <laughs> That's uh, good. And so the summaries are, are a great idea. There's, there's. Uh, it's important. Uh, yeah, no, they, they, uh, they, 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 they're, they're very good. Well, you have a great weekend and get some good sleep. I don't know when you're going to bed, but it's uh, 10.30 your time. So appreciate yep. it. Yeah. Thanks again, Peter. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, let you, uh, guys. It's I'll let you know when it comes out. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll probably be next week. So. Coming to South Africa? No. Uh, <laughs> not going anywhere. I'm saying it'll probably come out. the The podcast will uh, come out next. Podcast. Oh yeah, right. Okay. No, I would good. totally go. I would totally go. I, I, but I don't even think it's. I would even be allowed. Why wouldn't you be allowed? You mean just because of the pandemic? Yeah, I don't think we yeah. can even travel there. Do they no. allow Americans to get to go there. Yeah, not just yet, but uh, maybe by the end of the year. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, anyway, put that on put on that on your your bucket list. Um, well, I yeah. blew it. I should have just said I have to do a podcast interview with Peter live, or else it's not worth it. And that would have been business expense to go there. But <laughs> we'll figure something out. Thanks, we'll Peter. Out. Have a Thanks good night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Well, it's, it's been a, a real honor to to be chatting to you about this and, and keep up the good work. I think you're doing a great thing there.